Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll be talking about, not about OER this morning, normally I do, um, but today I will be talking about an initiative taken by the Berlin Senate a couple of years ago uh, at the commemoration of the falling walls, of the, fa the falling of the wall, of the Berlin Wall in 2000 and of 1989. In 2019, um, a foundation has been founded calling Falling Walls, and its aim was, and still is, to break, break walls, tear walls down in science and knowledge. There are several domains, and one of the new, newest domains is learning and education. It, um, it started uh, two years ago with the outbreak of the COVID-19 uh, COVID uh, 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 pandemic. And this is, um, it is uh, Falling Walls is a yearly conference around the 9th of November. Um, I am asked, I was uh, asked to make uh, an assessment of the first and second uh, round of nominations, and I will tell you about these uh, two kinds of nominations. And its central theme is accessibility, more, ex uh, more access and more accessibility of education and learning. Oh, come on. No. I'm struggling. And, um, and the central theme, what I said, is, uh, is which are the next uh, walls to fall, it also holds for education. And um, the Falling Walls uh, initiative of learning is called Future Learning. And um, the way it is organized, it consists of three parts. It's a future lab that it identifies, supports, and uh, uh, gives visibility to key initiatives. The second one is a hub for peer learning, networking. And the third one is a competition that scans the horizon and, and I will be talking especially about the third element of this competition. Oh, sorry. Uh, each year, um, Falling Walls for its uh, 10 uh, areas, uh, a competition is opened. It's, it's open at this very moment. And uh, the, uh, the nominations for learning are being validated on four, ele uh, four elements. First of all, the accessibility. How does it improve or uh, enlarge the accessibility of learning and education? The second one is, is it sustainable? Is the initiative sustainable? What are, what are the proofs of the sustainability? The third one is the impact. How much, how, how much impact does the initiative have? And, uh, and the fourth one is, is it scalable? Can it be replicated in different contexts in, di in different situations? The network consists of um, more than 200 stakeholders and innovators. And um, here are the figures for the 21 submission. There were uh, 71 ap applicants. Uh, 24 were shortlisted by an international jury, a peer review jury, and from these 10 winners resulted. And then finally, one will be selected by an international jury, another jury, uh, as the breakthrough of the year. Um, the applicants came from different countries. This, this is an overview of the countries. In total, there were 71 uh, submissions from 34 countries. In 2020, it was 35 countries. Europe is 37% of the submissions. In 2020, it was 41. Africa is 
in 2020 was 7%, and North America is 15%, and it was in 2020 32%. So there is uh, more, uh, there's a change in that the participation from the global south is increasing. And this is, and this is the result of enlarging the network of peers uh, from uh, the, the various uh, regions in the global south. The, the 71 submissions, we categorize them using the Holon IQ uh, taxonomy. It is a taxonomy originally used for uh, uh, allocating VC, this uh, uh, EdTech uh, uh, initiatives. And this uh, uh, taxonomy gives an overview of the different elements which can be discerned with regard to learning and education. Um, if you want to know more, there will be a publication from the Falling Walls Future Learning Initiative, one of these coming days, and then you can have a more uh, uh, close look at this taxonomy and how we derived it and, and enlarged it. In order to uh, make an assessment of the impact of the submissions, we used the SAMR uh, 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 topology, um, yesterday, it was also already mentioned uh, also, and it, and, and it says from uh, four categories are being discerned. The first one is substitution. Is the innovation a, a direct substitute with no functional change? The second one is augmentation. Does it add something so that the function is slightly changed, uh, uh, slightly altered? Um, uh, the third one is the modification. This the innovation allows significant changes, and the fourth one is a redefinition. It's completely new. Does it redefine uh, uh, a specific task or activity of learning? And what we did is that we allocated the several uh, uh, initiatives, and it turns out that 60% of them is in of the 71. So more than half is in the category of uh, uh, modification. In fact, 42 of the 71 entries. And 22 uh, of these entries uh, relate to important changes in learning, apps, boot camps, AR, VR, gaming and simulation, and new ways of learning STEM and coding. In the next slide, which is difficult, oh no, it's, it's big enough. These are the 10 winners categories. And what you can see is um, they come from 10 different countries. So th these uh, initiatives were not selected on the basis of countries. They were selected on the, on the information available on scaling uh, impact and all these uh, elements. And, and a peer review jury has uh, selected these uh, for uh, 10 winners. And the last one is Rory. I will tell more about it. It is the breakthrough of the year. It comes from Ghana. It is, for, uh, for, uh, it is developed by a for-profit for organization from Canada. And it is uh, concerned tutoring. And on the last uh, uh, column, you see the type of SAMR category. Most of them are uh, uh, modifications. And uh, two of them are redefinitions. We were asked, uh, uh, we is uh, Dominique Orr, and I were asked to make some reflections about um, the, the type of entries and what can be said of possible developments. And what we, we said, uh, and we discerned uh, the four trends. It is, um, there's an emphasis on low tech, and low tech used for scaling up and uh, uh, reaching impact. Uh, secondly, uh, there's an emphasis on networks, which build new social relationships. The third one is uh, um, within the, the submissions. There was an emphasis on learning labs, hybrid learning experiences to foster innovation. And the fourth one was recognizing and supporting the power of learning in the wild. I will go into each of these trends. 
and giving an example. This is um, raw, uh, the, the winner of last year. It is low tech. It is um, George Cowell, the director of Rising Academy Network. And he developed with his people a low cost uh, 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 tool using the, uh, the, uh, the telephone to an audio tools for engaging a personalized learning to any student on, on, on any phone. He, he did it in Liberia, Ghana, and um, Sierra Leone, and more than 50,000 people are being reached uh, momentarily. And it, it and entails a very simple tool on each phone, very simple phone, a, a, a pupil, a, 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 a student can follow, uh, can make a test, and then uh, he has to answer uh, the, 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 the uh, a question, and then uh, he, he or she gets a feedback whether it's a correct answer or, 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 or wrong answer. And also it gives directions where the pupil has to give attention to. It's a, it's, it's a, a low tech, the phone with on, on the backbone, a very intelligent AI system. And it is a, a combination using low tech with a high, with, sorry, with a high impact. The third one is, um, of the second one is, how networks will help build new, so new social relationships. It is an ad tech uh, platform with the mission of disrupting traditional secondary uh, education. And it is a real world learning as a core part of school. It is in place. Um, it uh, makes it easier for schools to reduce the opportunity gaps of their students by providing access to mentors for internships. The third element is learning labs. It is um, an ICT academy and tech, tech hub providing its communities with a right range of technology platforms on which people can learn and practice software development. It is uh, the introduction of online jobs, allowing people to solve their problems. And um, it is being developed in, uh, in Malawi and, and it, it is being used by uh, both refugees and rural communities, and it is uh, spread it out momentarily through Africa as a whole. The fourth one is recognizing and supporting the power of learning in the wild. Um, this is by uh, Sunny Jiang, M. Shul. It is a, a wandering chalice. It encourages uh, students to step out of school, make the city their classroom, and create meaningful learning and growth through interactions with the real world. And it is uh, breaking the walls of the traditional schools by using also high tech of a combination of, of low tech and in, in its backbone high tech. Lastly, we were also asked to reflect, to make a reflection on what is missing in the 71 submissions. And um, we found out, uh, to our opinion, three elements are just lacking, and the, the emphasis will be laid upon the submissions for this year. It is uh, the, the, the question of data, data mining and, 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 and using data, and data uh, uh, privacy and security. These, uh, there, are no, there was no project in which this item appeared as a focus of attention. Um, secondly, even if, share is, sh even if sharing is caring, it is also a way of, of us to provide more inclusive digital learning for all. This element of uh, more inclusive uh, learning, uh, digital learning, was also lacking as, as a, a, an element of attention and, and, and focus. And, and the last one, is greening tech. It's also about securing a better learning future for all. This element was not in 2020 an element, and not in 2021 a focus. There's still time to nominate your own project. This is the URL. Um, and so if you are aware of a project of, you know, uh, of yourself, of somebody you know, please submit it. Okay.
Thank you, Ben. Um, I think that we have some. Thank you, Ben. Um, I think that we have some time. If if anyone has any questions, um, perhaps I'll start off and just refer to one of these amazing projects. This is astonishing work. I, I actually typed something out so it would be a bit structured. Um, so you spoke about an emphasis on networks and building relationships. Um, I speak in particular about Rory AI in Sierra Leone, and you also referred to the low-tech devices. So as someone from the Global South, what are the bare minimum sort of characteristics of such a low-tech device, to, if you are aware, that would enable Rory to be functional? Just a very simple phone. A, a, a very simple telephone. Um, it is, it is just, so you don't need uh, an, an iPad, you don't need an iPhone, just old school telef uh, uh, telephones are being used. It, it has to have a screen, that's all, but it is, because it is audio, the, the, the phone is just a phone. A very ordinary, old fashioned phone can be the instrument. Or at the user side. On the backbone, it's very sophisticated. It's AI and, 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 and all kinds of services. Thank you. Um, anyone out there? Um, there's a microphone. So, um, Ben, thank you. Um, with all these projects you mentioned uh, that, uh, like you were saying, are um, um, revolve around uh, a network building. How much of that is uh, reliant on proprietary software, um, for one? And uh, for second, do you feel like um, if you would look more at um, European and North American context, it would be, uh, people would be less inclined to use uh, free or open software because there's um, better accessibility to proprietary software or better affordability of proprietary software for network building? I don't, okay. Um, I don't have an exact figure, figure of the proportion of the, pre, uh, of the projects submitted relying on proprietary software or open source. But I know that, um, let's, say, let's say 60, 64, 65% of the projects are projects from non-governmental uh, uh, organizations and not-for-profit organizations and most of them use open source software or at least um, make the tools they develop available as open source tools. Um, I, the uh, second part of the question whether it's more easy to rely on proprietary software I don't know. I, I cannot give you the answer on this question. But it's a good question. I think we should include it in next year's evalu evaluation. Thank you. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, my name is Will. I, I lead Frontiers for Young Minds. We're one of the sponsors of, of this event. Um, we're an open access journal for kids. Um, so there's quite a lot of synergy here. And we actually did put in an application <laughs> ourselves back in April. Um, my question is related to shaping content tracks and the direction of them. Um, we publish individual articles, but we're looking to make sure that those articles that are written by re real researchers can be integrated into local, national, or supranational curricula. My question would be, in your view, would shaping mini curricula enhance our scalability for a classroom? Because at the moment, whilst we can publish individual articles written by researchers and reviewed by kids, and we can certainly collect them and publish them in, and collate them in collections, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a tag missing on them, which is the kind of the pedagogical element to it. And I'm curious to know if that's something that uh, you think would help with scalability uh, in those kinds of issues. It's a multifaceted uh, 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 question um, about... Um, the, 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 you were asking about the, the size of, of the, the, the um, learning objects. Um, 
it differs, what I know about the projects, it, it differs very, very much. Most of them are very small. Because, uh, and also, the in, there's, two, there's no, not one initiative, yeah, there are some initiatives of the 721 which relate to uh, a curriculum or part of a curriculum, which in, in its entire form. But most of them uh, use very small learning objects. Um, and your second part was? Yeah? yeah. It, it, it's fine, go on. Um, so the second part was around um, scalability for classrooms, okay. specifically. Um, because of course, whilst, for example, in, in your organization where um, sort of open education resources can help with sort of supplementing yeah. whilst national curricular changes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm curious to know if there's specific elements of OER resources that um, make them more uh, suitable for scalability in those, in those scenarios. We haven't looked at this particular aspect of scalability. We, we looked at the, at the scalability of the, 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 in, the initiatives in total, in its entirety. And uh, you are, are asking about one of the building blocks of the several initiatives. We haven't looked at it. I, I cannot give you an answer on your question. I'm sorry. Well, thank you. I think we'll move on to our second presentation. Thank you, Ben. Uh, can we have a round of applause?